Hello, I am Arts by Kev. Are you ready to become a Blockbench artist and learn how to use this 3D software to make models for Minecraft and other games? Then you will be happy to hear that it's very easy to get started. And as if that wasn't enough, I will also be holding your hand throughout this entire series. My hopes are that I will be able to both showcase and also give you a lot of tips on our journey together. If you open up a web browser and head to blockbench.net, you will be greeted by this main page. Here, we can choose to download Blockbench and install it on our PC, or we can open up the web app. Opening up the web app will take us to this Blockbench editor, and you can use the Blockbench web app on any device that has a browser, such as, for example, your phone and your tablet. I am personally not the biggest fan of Blockbench on my phone, but I do sometimes use it when I'm out traveling. At its very core, Blockbench is often referred to as a pixel art low-poly 3D modeling software. It is the most versatile software for creating Minecraft assets. Yes, Mojang also work with Blockbench and I can guarantee it's safe to use. With Blockbench now installed or open in your browser, we will begin by getting ourselves acquainted with the interface and how to navigate in the 3D space. For this exercise, we will create a new product from the first product type in the list, a generic product. Each project type comes with its own configurations and we will visit other projects in separate videos. If you are insecure about what a project type is for, all the information you need is listed when you click on it in the list. If we click on a Java slash block item project type, we are presented with a different set of information, relevant to making 3D items and blocks for Java Minecraft. The generic format gives us the most creative liberty over our 3D designs, making it a great starting point when you begin learning Blockbench. So let's create a new model. Whenever you create a new project, you will be greeted by this interface. This box holds different information depending on what the project is for. And in this case, there is nothing we will immediately touch in this interface. For now, you can click on Confirm, Cancel or the X button to close this window. Or simply, outside of it. Welcome to the workspace. First, let's explore the viewport. That is the big open field here in the middle. We can rotate the camera of our viewports by clicking and holding the left mouse button. Like this. Up and down. We can move the camera of our viewports by clicking and holding our right mouse button. And do this. You zoom in and out of the viewports by scrolling on the scroll wheel. I say viewports because there is an option to enable more camera angles. Head to the view section up here. Click on Split Screens, and here you can select to show additional windows in your workspace, such as this one. As you notice, I can zoom in and out in all of these different spaces and move them around to my own content. I say try some of them out and see what fits you the best. I will generally only work with a single view in order to keep things easy to follow. And if you by any means happen to get stuck in a view only seeing the model from one direction, you can right click. Go down to Angles, and go up and click on Initial Angle. That should bring it back to this view. This can also be done if you go to the number pad on your keyboard and press 1. And that should have you covered with the basics. Next, let's create our first cube. In order to add new cubes, we need to be working in the Edit tab, which we can tell by this underline. And here on the sides, we have Panels. The panels change depending on what tab you're in since each tab is for a different task. You can also move these panels around and put them where you prefer to have them when you work. I will leave mine like it is so that it matches the default settings when you open Blockbench. This panel down here is called the Outliner. It is where we find the list of all cubes, bones and meshes that we have active in this project. And here, in the menu above, this square icon with a plus symbol is where we add new cubes to the 3D workspace. Let's create one. As you notice, the cube is now listed here in the Outliner. And it's here in our 3D viewport. New cubes will always be created at the center of the grid you see here in the workspace. This grid can be hidden by going to View and unticking the Show Grids checkbox. And the same to show it again. Modeling is all about creating a pile of cubes that looks like something when we are done. To start modeling, Here's the Tools panel. By default, we got a Move, a Scale, a Rotate, a Pivot and a Vertis Snap tool. First, let's start out with the three basic ones. With the Move tool, when you have selected a cube, you get these three arrows. Hold and drag on one to move the cube in the direction that you're pulling. 
The resize tool, or scale tool as I refer to it, has these six lines with cubes at the ends. Hold and drag on one of these to scale the cube from that side in the direction of your movement. If you reach zero, it will normally come to a stop. If you go into settings, under file, preferences, and settings, snapping, and selecting negative size, you see that it says allow the resize tool to use negative sizes. Normally you do want to avoid using this, but if you are looking to make inverted cubes, this is the way to do it. So I would normally recommend that you tick this box and leave it active. Let's close that. Now if I take this side again and pull out and pull towards the screen, you notice that it continues scaling on this end. But wait, if we zoom in, it has this weird jittery surface to it. That is because the cube has been inverted. And if we look at the size of this cube, over here under the element, x and y are 2 sixteenths of a block thick, and this axis is minus 15, because it's scaling negatively from the central point. And to get it back, we need to pull on the same side that originally gave us that negative value. So be careful when you're using this tool. And to get back to this view again, right click, angles, initial angle, or press 1 on your number pad. And then the rotate tool. The rotate tool is signified by these circles. As you notice, there are thicker areas on the circles. They are meant for us to grab onto. And it is generally easier to click where it is thicker. And then all you need to do is to hold and drag to rotate the cube in the direction of your movement. Let's say I've ended up with a cube like that, and I don't know how to reset it. There are a few ways to go about this. The first one could be this element menu. Set the rotation to zero in all of these squares. That has now returned our cube to where it was. But you can also go up into the Edit tab. Click Undo, and as you notice, next to Undo and Redo, it also shows us the keyboard shortcuts. Ctrl Z to Undo, and Ctrl Y to Redo. But if you undo and rotate it in a different way, and then try to redo, the previous redo is now gone. Since redo will only ever care about the things that took you to where you are right now. So if you undo and then do something new from there, that is now what you will be able to redo. Tinker around with that in a project like this one to get used to how it works. So now when we have moved, scaled and rotated a bit, let's look at the pivot tool. The pivot tool gives us what looks like the move tool. But as opposed to the move tool, this tool does not move the cube. This moves the cube's pivot. So hold on for a second. What is a pivot? The pivot is also known as the model's origin, especially if you since previously are familiar with other 3D softwares. It is the very position where the 3D world thinks the cube is located. You would maybe think that the center mass would be where that was. But this is digital 3D, and here anything is possible. If I would want my pivot to instead be over here, I will simply click and drag it to this position. Now, in a sense, this cube is located here, but it's also here. But the cube is actually connected to the world over here. But there is a lot more to the pivot tool than you may understand at first glance. And mastering the pivot position is the difference between a good and a great modeler. See, over here, is a very important setting that I get asked about a lot, and one that beginners must learn to use properly. Any modeler should get comfortable changing this over and over while they work to achieve different results. This is known as the transform space, and to try and describe briefly what it does before showing you, you can set it to local, global, and bone. Generally, you only work with local and global. Local space means that you only move the cube, but not the pivot. And we can tell, because clicking on the pivot tool, you will notice that it appears down here instead, as opposed to where the cube is. Local space also means that when you rotate a cube, you rotate around its own axis. And as you may notice, these circles change direction because I've been rotating the cube. Keep that in mind as we jump over to check out the global settings. Global space means that when you move the cube, you also move the pivot. Did you notice that something followed the cube as we moved it up? Let's take a look at the pivot tool. Ah. It's connected at the bottom of our cube, which is the same position that it had in correlation to the cube before we moved it. And global space also means that when you rotate, you rotate around the axis in this 3D space and not around the cube's axis. So if I rotate the cube a little now, 
you notice that this doesn't change, and I now rotate according to what these coordinates say, as opposed to what the cube's actual directions are. And if I go back into local mode on the rotation, you notice that instead we follow the orientation of the cube. I heavily recommend you spend some time testing and getting used to moving the pivot, moving and rotating in the different spaces of local and global. When I made my first Blockbench tutorial series back in 2020, the space was set to global by default. Nowadays, however, it is set to local, so keep that in mind. When you're in the local space and you move a cube around, and you then rotate it, it may end up somewhere completely different to what you imagined. This is why it's important to keep a track on where the pivot is located. I recommend that you always double check your pivots on all of your cubes as you're moving them around, and also that you at regular intervals double check whether you are working in a global or local space. Also, beware that local space can be applied to rotation while you're working in the global space on movement, and vice versa. And mastering these tools will not only speed up your modeling process, it will also make complex modeling a breeze down the lane. And then there is the Vertex Snap tool. The default setting for this tool is Move, and that is pretty much the only setting you will ever use for this tool. But in order to showcase properly what the Vertex Snap tool does, I will first have to show you something else. This is a different cube we've made. And if you want to create a cube directly at the same place and with the same size as another cube, you can simply duplicate it by selecting it in the viewport, or by selecting it in the Outliner panel by clicking on it. Right click, and then Duplicate. Now there should be two of these cubes in your workspace. And you can also use the keyboard short command by holding down CTRL and pressing D. To then deselect any cubes, left click anywhere where there's empty space here in the Outliner. Now is also a good time to mention that you can name your cubes in the Outliner, that way they are easier to locate. Double click on the cube, or right click and select Rename. Then type the new name. And when you are done, simply press Enter, or simply just click elsewhere to apply the new name. Now this cube is known as Name, and this cube is known as Cube. Another way to keep them separated is by right clicking on one of the cubes, going down to Marker Color, and changing it to a different color so that when we are working with our model, we can tell them apart by these color codes. Of course, when you have a bigger and more complex model, you will still be better off making sure that you know what cube is what by having a good naming convention. So, this Vertex Snap tool is a very nifty tool to know about. In this scene, I have two cubes. I want to put the green one on top of my pink one. If I select one of the cubes with the Vertex Snap tool, you'll notice that we get these small dots at the corners of our cube. These are the vertex points of our cube model. And if this cube had been created as a mesh, using this tool instead, as opposed to the Add Cube one, also only available for generic projects, we could have clicked on one of these corners and pulled them to change the cube into something else. But when using the Vertex Snap tool, what we can do is to align a corner of one of the cubes with a corner of another cube. So first I need to select a model that I want to move, by clicking on it, then I will select a corner that I want to align with the corner of another cube. And I'm gonna use the one here down at the very bottom. You'll notice that I have a small arrow next to my regular cursor now. Then I will click on the other cube and select the corner I want my first cube to move to. So select the cube, and then I want that corner to go to this corner. And there we are. Now my cube is resting nicely on top of the other cube. This is an extra useful tool if you want to align a cube with something that is sitting at an angle. In this case, I could click on this bottom corner here, click on this cube, and then select this corner instead. Now we get a nice and flush outer edge. This thing right here is called C fighting. It happens because these cubes are equally thick, and Blockbench and any other game this asset would be put into simply does not know which of these two cubes to render first in this area, where they both exist at the same time. To solve this issue, we can add the Inflate tool. And that is done by going up to one of these toolbars, where you see these three dots. We'll select the one here to the left, and go to Customize when clicking on it, and in this search bar, type Inflate. This is the Inflate tool, and we add it by clicking on it. 
and as you notice, it appears hidden. It isn't actually hidden, it's just that since we have no cube selected, there is nothing for us to inflate. But the moment I select one of these cubes, the inflate tool will appear up here in the top menu. So selecting the green cube, we now see inflate here at the top. And I can take inflate and shrink this cube by a tiny amount, typing minus 0 0.001 and then enter. Now this cube is just a slight bit tinier than the pink cube below it. So when we rotate around, the pink cube will always be the one that shows in this area. And this is one of the best ways to solve the problem with C fighting in a simple and fast way. What is also great about Inflate is that it doesn't damage our textures. And that is a topic we will return to in the upcoming project videos. You may also notice, as I have selected this cube called Name, that the pivot is located out here. We can actually also move the pivot with the Vertis Snap tool. If you click on the pivot, and then on any corner of your cube, it will snap onto that corner. Just beware, if I now want to select this corner of the cube, that is going to be a bit of a hassle, because the pivot and the vertice is in the same location, making it very difficult for Blockbench to tell which one to select for you when you click on them. But that's an issue that can be resolved in a lot of different ways. The fastest and simplest way is to just go into the pivot tool and move it away from the corner. And now you can work with it freely again. Oh, look at the time. Well, luckily we've just covered the basics. And from this moment on, the fun awaits. The biggest difference with this new tutorial series, as opposed to the one I made back in 2020, is that now we will work on different projects and try to make these things together. An example of such a project could be this adventure sign prop that is animated. But I'm also thinking of models such as this one. More intricate things where we need to think about the texture before we start working on the model itself. Oh, and this is the memory note for me to tell you that if this sounds interesting, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe and I'll see you around in the next video.